So how far can you talk on VHF, UHF, or GMRS? Well, there's three answers to that. The short answer, the long answer, and the truth. Now, as we begin the quest for the truth to figure out how far you can talk from one handheld to the next, we're not going to dive too deep down into radio theory and radio dorkdom. We're just going to give you simple, straight answers so you can understand and figure this out. If I get enough comments asking for a follow-up video to get down into the nitty-gritty to go over every subtle nuance of this, I certainly will. But uh, for the most part, people just want the question answered. The short answer is your maximum range on flat open ground is about 6.8 miles. That's best case scenario. That assumes that there's no elevation changes between you and who you're talking to. There's no terrain deviations, no hills, no mountains, no valleys. Assumes that there's no obstructions such as buildings, trees, or vegetation. The soil has a relative average conductivity. It ignores uh, potential ground wave propagation with VHF. Um, any type of unreliable or out-of-the-box type phenomena that does occur such as tropospheric ducting, scatter, moon bouncing or any of that silliness and uh, it includes a, an 11 percent beyond your visual line of sight when calculating your radio horizon so 6.8 miles with an antenna height at both ends on flat ground at about six feet is about the max you're going to get now this flat open ground is hard to determine because when you're standing at a point on the earth and looking over the horizon, there can be huge elevation changes that are subtle enough that it looks flat to you, but it's really not. There are relatively few areas of the country where the ground is flat, flat, like Taylor Swift under a steamroller flat. Most everywhere else has a lot of deviation with elevation from point A to point B. So we'll go over some of that now. To help visualize some of the terrain changes between two points when it comes to uh, establishing radio communications, there's an online uh, tool called Radio Mobile Online. It's made by a gentleman at VE2DBE. The link for that will be in the description. It helps you uh, get a good visual representation of a radio link between uh, two points. Another helpful resource in planning your radio communications and getting good maps in general is the U.S. Geological Service topographical maps. The link for that online will be in the video description. Um, they also have historical data from maps that go back, uh, some of these I've seen go back to all the way to like the early 1900s. So if you're interested in getting historical maps, that's also uh, a good resource for that as well. Now that we got the short answer out of the way, let's get into the long answer a little bit. You may hear that VHF can travel two or three times the distance that UHF can, and all things being equal, that is true. You may also hear that VHF can punch through trees or forest or punch through foliage or obstacles better than UHF can, and that simply isn't true. There are times where VHF will outperform UHF, and there's other times where UHF will outperform VHF, and we're going to explain why. We're going to take the myth and the mystery out of it, and you'll know exactly why one may outperform the other in a particular scenario. Now, what you see here is a representation of VHF and UHF sine waves. You'll see that the UHF sine waves, the peaks and valleys, are spaced out much further than the UHF, and the frequency depends on those peaks and valleys. The closer those peaks and valleys are together, the higher the frequency. The more spread out they are, the lower the frequency. Take, for instance, like a, a spring. If you compress that spring, that's a representation of a higher frequency. If you pull that spring apart, that's a representation of a, a lower frequency. Now, continuing with the spring analogy, with UHF, if you compress that spring, you have more energy in a smaller area. With VHF, pulling that spring out a little bit, you have that energy spread out over a larger area. The sine waves that you see here are only half of what's actually going on. RF energy, it's an electromagnetic wave, very similar to light. In fact, it is light. It's just not in the visible spectrum. You have a, an electric field that goes perpendicular to the magnetic field. When the RF energy begins to radiate, it's not quite organized until about two or three wavelengths away from your antenna. This is called the near field. After organizing, it begins to propagate virtually at the speed of light as an organized electromagnetic wave. This wave begins to degrade immediately as soon as it starts to travel. And this happens at a 
logarithmic scale. So think of it like an inverted hockey stick. The further you go, the faster it's going to degrade. The higher the frequency, the faster it's going to degrade. In perfect conditions, VHF can travel much further than UHF, but in practical conditions, you're going to find things like obstruction, terrain. It's going to affect both, so you're not going to get twice the distance in any scenario just by switching from UHF to VHF. And all this can be explained with inverse square law and Maxwell equations, but you didn't come for that, and I'm not Albert Einstein. So now let's get into the truth of how far you can actually talk on a handheld radio. For this, we're going to give a couple different scenarios just to give you a good idea of what to expect and how to use different frequencies on HT radios depending on your conditions and your surroundings. So in scenario number one, you and a group of friends are hiking through the woods in uh, semi-hilly conditions uh, surrounded by trees and foliage. After a while, your group splits up. You want to take and keep in contact using your radios, but you have to figure out what frequencies that you're going to use. Now, when we get into uh, further videos developing a pace plan for communications, this should already be established. But the first thing that you have to realize is the distances that you are going to be talking at. If you're going to be in relatively close distances in a terrain that's got a little bit of hills, some rocks, trees, and foliage, your best bet is going to be using UHF versus VHF, and I'm going to explain why. Imagine as you're walking along, hiking, instead of carrying your radio, you're carrying a postcard, and you're holding that up above your head. And as you walk through the woods, your postcard may hit some leaves, it may hit some twigs, it may hit a couple branches, but that signifies the size of your radio wave. Now, by contrast, imagine instead of holding up that postcard, you're holding up a sheet of plywood and you're hitting trees and foliage and the ground and God knows what else is in the woods. As that comes around, you can see that the postcard will navigate through the woods and those obstructions much easier than that sheet of plywood will. Now, conversely, that sheet of plywood is going to hold up better to being struck by those branches and trees and leaves than your postcard will. So that's a good analogy to describe the differences between UHF and VHF in this scenario. The VHF being the plywood and UHF being the postcard. The postcard is going to be able to travel in between the branches and the leaves a little bit better than the sheet of plywood is, but it's going to take more damage, so to speak, from the branches and the trees, and it's going to suffer higher degradation. Now, in a scenario where you come up to a hill, both the postcard, UHF, and the plywood, VHF, are going to meet a dirt hill. It's not going to propagate through that no matter how much power you use. If you change that from your handheld and you're putting out 5 watts and then you go to a mobile putting out 50 watts, dirt's hard to get through. It's not going to go. It's going to stop. So 50 watts, 500 watts, you're not going to push that signal through a mountain. So in this type of scenario with UHF, you're probably looking at between a mile and a half and three miles of decent communication, but again, that's going to depend upon the terrain. If you find yourself in this scenario and you're getting intermittent contact or no contact at all, moving to higher ground will definitely help establish that communication. So in our next scenario, we venture all the way out to Plankton, Ohio. We're going to place George in Melmore, Ohio, which is about five and a half miles north of Plankton. And the reason why we chose these two locations is randomly. And it's open. There's a little bit of trees. It's typical of what you would see in a flat, open scenario. So if we were to draw a circle around Plankton, uh, say three and a quarter miles representing our radio horizon, and then another one at three and a quarter miles from Melmore where George is, you would see that those radio horizons would overlap and we would be able to establish communications with each other. We could also talk to anybody whose radio horizon would meet ours or overlap. And in this scenario, it's probably about 12 or 13 poor Ohioans that live in that area. Now, if we were to move George from Melmore out to McCutcheonville, this was established by Old Man McCutcheon at the end of the War of the Roses, um, that is beyond each other's radio horizons and we would not be able to speak. So now in this next scenario, we're traveling to Southern California to uh, Mount San Antonio, right to the summit. And we're going to put George in Barstow just because we don't like George very much. 
So we need to establish that radio link from the top of Mount San Antonio to Barstow, California, which is about 55, 56 miles. And even though that our radio horizon is only three and a quarter miles because we have the elevation there at the top of the mountain, we can make radio contact 55 miles away on handhelds. If you've ever heard the saying when it comes to radios, height is might. In this scenario, that proves it. Now, some notable exceptions to everything that I've showed you so far is with operating over a saltwater environment. This is especially true with Marine VHF. I've used Marine VHF on and off for probably the better part of 30 years now. And I've made contact from boat to boat where our radio horizons weren't even in the same ballpark of, be of meeting to be close. We're talking... 22 to 24 miles with antennas that were eight or nine feet above the surface of the water. This takes place because of uh, surface wave or ground wave propagation where the salt water is just a excellent conductor. It allows the, uh, the VHF radio wave to travel right across the surface of the water. It's still degrading the entire time it's traveling, but it degrades much, much less than if it's traveling over the surface of soil and or hitting any type of obstacles or foliage. Now we're not defying any physics here. The square inverse law still applies. It's still degrading and it degrades faster as it travels. And with regards to UHF and surface wave propagation, eh, forget it. That's not even in the realms of possibility. So really to get a good idea of how far you can talk on a handheld to handheld is to get out with a buddy and test. Go to the areas where you think you're going to be using your handhelds and just see what these distances and ranges are. As far as what radio to get, the Bofang uh, 5RM, I'm a real big fan. I like that. The uh, Koshang UVK5, uh, my wife really likes that. She likes how it fits her hand. She likes the screen a little bit better. Um, but most of these handheld UHF, VHF, or tri-band radios, they're all basically at the same price point. They all basically have similar output power. They're all basically going to do the same same job so the thing that really makes the difference is the conditions how high you're up and what's in between who you and the person you're talking to so if you found this video helpful leave me a comment leave me a thumbs up and let me know what you would like to see next